Welcome everyone. On behalf of Visual Communications, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Janum and Okairi for their partnership and passion to still create community with each other. The Los Angeles American, um, Asian American Film Festival happens because of community partners like Janum and Okairi. Throughout my life, Little Tokyo has represented home for me. Janum continues to be that place where I can learn about my culture and history. Visual communications continues to be the catalyst for me to push artists to tell their stories. And though Okairi is new to my life, it already gives me hope for the future for others like me. When our community intersects and converges, anything is possible. I'm so excited for this conversation, and I know all of you are too, so I'm enjoy everyone, and I'm going to pass it over to your moderator, Aya. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aya. Um, she, her pronouns. Um, I am a part of the Okairi Planning Committee, and I'm super excited and really honored um, to be moderating this conversation with really very badass, um, I'm going to say elders of the Nikkei LGBTQ community. Um, so just a little bit um, about Okaidi um, for those of you who are new to Okaidi. Um, Okaidi started in 2014 uh, when a group of Nikkei LGBTQ plus individuals, parents, and allies organized a gathering called Okaidi, a Nikkei LGBTQ gathering. And this was the first ever conference that was focused on the LGBTQ plus Nikkei community. Um, and since then, Okaidi has held um, a total of three uh, in-person gatherings, um, each bringing um, over 200 participants together in, um, at Janum, actually. Um, and since then, it's really grown into more than just um, a place where folks gather, but it's really a place where Nikkei LGBTQ plus individuals, families, and allies can connect, build, learn, and really organize with one another um, to really bring change within the Japanese American community as well as the greater, um, as well as the greater society. And um, fun fact, today would have actually been our fourth in-person gathering if it were not for this pandemic that is raging on. Um, so we're really um, glad to have you all join us. And um, I also want to give a shout out to um, our funder. This program um, is made possible in part by the Beyond Two Cents LGBTQ AAPI Giving Circle. So thank you so much for supporting us and making this possible. Um, and now I am going to ask all of our wonderful panelists to turn on the camera slash come out from hiding from backstage. There you all are, thank you. <laughs> awesome, so I'm going to give a very, very brief um, introduction of our amazing panelists. Oh, also Mia, if you are here. Oh, hello, there you are, great. Um, so I'm gonna give a really brief um, intro of our lovely panelists. And the reason it's brief is because I want you all to stick around and hear what they have to say. That is the whole point of this conversation. And also, um, we would really love for you to watch the videos um, of each of their interviews That's that I've really learned a lot from. So um, I'm going to start with Mia. Uh, Mia Yamamoto is a criminal defense attorney and legal community activist. Hi, Mia. <laughs> Um, Melvin Fujikawa is a widowed gay man after his husband, Mark Hamner, died in 2017. He is currently working as a pastoral counselor at Evergreen Baptist Church of Los Angeles, a church he worked at for 10 years before he came out of the closet in 2010. Hi, Melvin. Um, Bill Tashima is a 69-year-old gay sansei, originally from Ohio now happily married in Fall City, Washington, who likes to volunteer in the JA community and for whom disco will never die. Hi, Bill. I encourage all of you to ask Bill questions about disco because I still don't know what this is about and I want answers. So please feel free to ask questions. <laughs> um, and then we have Gary Hayashi, um, who does marriage and family therapy in South Pasadena. 
blessings with the gay men's chorus of LA and Los Angeles and wishes he were in San Francisco this weekend. Hi, Gary. I'm glad you're here in LA with us. <laughs> um, and then we have Barney Chang, who is an award-winning writer-director who works on feature films, episodic television, and documentaries. And so Barney is um, the director who, um, who created all of the lovely interview um, videos of our panelists. So hi, Barney. And then we have uh, Marsha Izumi, who is one of the founders of Okaidi, and I'm going to say a loving parent to many Nikkei LGBTQ plus individuals, families, and allies. So hi, Marsha. <laughs> Thank you for being here. So we're just gonna get right to this conversation. Um, the first question, we just wanted to open up um, with hearing a little bit from Barney, who's the director, um, and hearing a little bit about what your vision and inspiration, um, what, what was your vision and inspiration in creating this series, and, um, and how did your own identities influence your vision for this project as a director? Thank you so much for having me here. Um, you know, growing up in, in America as an Asian American and LGBTQ uh, person, um, I really saw uh, images of me represented on television or media. Um, so I'm a very active member of the community now, but I've, I've, I, I wasn't always an active member. Um, I think it was, I want to say four years ago, I met uh, our producer, Marsha Aizumi, um, at some kind of lawyer function. Um, and she connected me to a PFLAG, a San Gabriel Valley API chapter. Um, and I became actively involved in the organization. Um, so from that organization, I started becoming more involved. Um, so I'm now a very active member of the LGBTQ and Asian American community. Um, as I mentioned before, we growing up here in America, I, I really saw images of myself on TV and media. So as a mission um, of a film myself as a filmmaker, I really wanted to uh, create a project uh, or get involved in project that empower my community. Um, so when Marsha approached me about Okaidi, uh, documenting voices of queer Japanese Americans, 60 plus, um, to empower our community, I mean, it was just a perfect project to get involved in. Um, so yeah, so I'm very, very honored to be able to contribute my filmmaking skills to, to this project. Um, in terms of vision, I, it was really uh, Marsha Izumi's vision, uh, my produce, producer's vision, and I'm just here to execute and honor her vision. So I would love for her to talk more about the vision of the project. Thank you so much, Barney. And I have to say, it really wasn't my vision, it was Gary Hayashi's vision. What happened, we were at a strategic planning uh, event. Every year after our Okaidi conferences, we uh, sit down and kind of debrief and strategically plan. And Gary said during this meeting, you know, we have to capture these voices. We're losing people, we're losing the story, we're losing the history. And so it was Gary that really put that idea um, in my mind and in Okaidi. And so I think my vision really was to capture, because of Gary's, uh, you know, Gary's vision, to really capture LGBTQ Nikkei history. So it isn't lost, so we have it, we can archive it, people can refer back to it. And there's so many amazing stories. You're gonna hear so many amazing stories today. I think the other thing that came about was, you know, these stories uh, give our young LGBTQ people role models. And they can see what people have done in the past, whose shoulders we stand on, how they can live a successful life, be 
um, who they are, their true selves, and, and be successful and find love and success. And, you know, I just think these people that are doing these films, I am like so grateful to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, so that was, I think, the vision that came out of this. So Barney, I'll toss it back to you. What? Why don't you toss it to Gary? Okay, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if any of you know Marsha, you know that all you have to do is lob a good idea in her direction and she will take it and run with it. Um, but the genesis of the idea actually came uh, at a dinner uh, a friend of ours, Stan Yogi, who is one of the co-moderators uh, of Okaidi now, uh, started having dinners of Japanese American gay men over 40 in, in his apartment. And we were sitting around at one of those dinners and what came up in the conversation is uh, the realization that we had no role models to watch, to see what it was like to be Japanese American LGBTQ and come out and to live successful lives. And, and <clears throat> we really uh, were sort of mourning that loss. And so that's where the initial idea came from was, we have to document the Nisei stories of LGBTQ. And unfortunately we couldn't find any. <laughs> so that's how the project landed aimed at uh, current uh, Japanese American LGBTQ out people, uh, elders, pioneers, whatever you want to call us. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that um, backstory. Um, and and for for all of you who have not yet had the opportunity to watch this, um, we'll mention this throughout. But um, I'll I'll say it right now. Um, you can go to the Okaidi website, which is um, www.okaidi, which is O K A E R I dash Los Angeles L O S A N G E L E S dot org slash media, and um, and I think Joy has also dropped the link um, into the chat box. So if you want to go check out the interviews um, after this conversation, you will not regret it. It's, it's wonderful. So um, that's where you can access those. Um, so as somebody who has had the privilege of watching all of these um, interviews, um, and, and as the title of our event um, speaks a little bit about, um, coming out definitely was a very big um, topic that each of you spoke about at length um, in your interviews. And, um, you know, I think coming out has continued to be this big topic within the LGBTQ community, but also I think for folks who don't identify as LGBTQ, it's this sort of mythical grand thing that everybody wants to ask about and talk about, right? Like what was your coming out story was, you know, how did it go? What was, just tell us everything. And, um, and also I want to point out that as a younger person, um, I think there continues to be this idea um, and, and I feel like it might be increasing in some ways that um, now because LGBTQ topics and issues and conversations have become much more common in the mainstream media, um, there seems to be a lot of pressure on young people to come out. You know, coming out equals authentic. Coming out um, means that you're courageous and anything else means that, you know, you're lying to yourself, that you're... Um, that you know that you're living a double life and you should be ashamed of it and there's nothing to worry about and there's nothing you know that should be holding you back from coming out because look at all this wonderful stuff that's out in the world and all the support you have right and and i think that's um that tends to be uh, become a little bit um uh dangerous and and i think po uh, painful for a lot of folks when when they're really trying to figure out their own journey and really, um, in, in watching all of your interviews, um, I think each of you uh, really had a lot of time to reflect on what, quote, being in the closet meant for you um, and, and what 
how you spent that time, right? And how it has led to who you are today. So um, it, to no one in particular, anybody who has the courage to talk first, um, how, what impact do you think your um, own coming out process um, have not just on your LGBTQ plus identity, but also all of your other identities, right? Including your Japanese American identity, including maybe your Christian identity, maybe including, um, you know, being a sibling to somebody, right? Um, so what, what, how, how did that process um, impact you today? I want to say that when I, when I, listen to everybody's stories and um and when when i went home and i and i started editing all the videos i just it just reminded me of the difficult journey of coming out i came out in 19 my god 1989 long time ago but so so it just reminded me of how difficult it was at the time and and what stood out for me was like you said before i uh, that everybody's journey is so different all, every, all the subjects, everyone's journey was so different it's, and it was difficult in their own ways. So it's a reminder that coming out, it's a journey that's very individual. Everybody's journey is different. So we have to honor that process. That, 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 that was a big reminder for me. Um, listening to people's story and editing their stories and just putting all the videos together. It was really, it was an amazing experience. I want, to, I want to agree with Barney because uh, one thing that I've learned through this process um, is just gaining a, a really deep respect for my fellow panelists and being inspired by them. And as Barney said, everybody's journey is different. It's individual. Coming out, there's no one coming out story. It's not like, you know, here today, gay tomorrow. It's kind of, um, it differs from with everyone. For me, for example, it was a journey of, of first coming out to myself, first admitting to myself that I was gay, and then slowly coming out to some friends. And then it works out where you come out to co-workers or, or to the public, and it's, it's, not, and it's not easy. I think that there's a misconception that because gay and lesbian have more, finally have achieved the rights that they deserve, that are theirs. And because there's more media coverage and we're, we're, we appear everywhere that uh, coming out is, should be easy. But I always think, you know, it's never easy for a young person to come out and say that I'm different. You know, the only difference today from my day is that I, someone coming out today doesn't have to feel alone. That hopefully, you know, whether we're role models or not, the fact is there's people like us and other people and organizations who care. And I think that's the, the big message about coming out today and what's different. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention about doing the, this program, and I'm really glad that Gay, um, Barney and and Marsha and Gary had this idea is, I used to wonder why the Nisei never really talked about internment or incarceration, you know? And when they did, it was always happy times. And then I realized you don't really talk about uh, things that were bad. You don't, but I think today it's important that we talk about our struggles and so we can relate to other people now and so that they will gain a strength thinking, well, it's easy for Bill or it's easy for Barney. Well, it wasn't easy for us, you know? Um, and so I think that uh, even though I don't consider myself uh, a trailblazer or a pioneer or anything like that, I did experience my life in the closet and then coming out. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's the story that I like to talk about. So thanks everyone. Yeah, Bill, what you mentioned about like not rushing into it, uh, it really resonated with me and it reminds me of Melvin's story 
about not rushing the pain, the process, right? You have to honor that process. Yeah, yeah. I didn't much. <laughs> my, uh, my coming out anniversary, my 10 year coming out anniversary is coming up. It's October the 12th, 2020. This, this year, I came out October 12th, 2010. Um, and I'll, I was 55, I'm 65 years old, so I obviously didn't rush. The closet was, um, yeah, it was hard and uh, it, was, it was difficult, but sort of like you started out, I, at the beginning, we have to respect, um, it's a journey. It's a journey in the closet and coming out is not a one-time deal. Coming out is a process and it takes, we come out again and again and again. It just, it just sort of snowballs because you don't, I didn't even know how much I was, how much didn't come out. Cause it's not just about sexual orientation. It's all connected, right? So all of that, um, it just, I'm still coming out 10 years later. I, I, I discover things about being gay now that I totally didn't think about when I came out in 2010. And um, Gary Hayashi, who's on this panel, was one of the first persons I told, and um, which was wonderful. Thank, I'm so grateful to Gary. Gary said something to me, and I'm sure, I'm sure he remembers, but he said to me, on that fateful day when we sat and talked, he said to me, you know, he goes, everyone, everyone needs to come out. And I thought about that and I didn't understand. <laughs> but now I understand, it's true. And, and the story I'll share more later, but um, my outing started this sort of snowball thing where like became like, it was became the thing to do. Everybody started outing and I'm like, oh my goodness. And it wasn't about, wasn't all of, not all of it wasn't about sexual orientation or in, far, in fact most of it wasn't but um but it was this this wonderful thing that released a lot of other people once i started um, once i started the journey so i'm very grateful gary do you remember when melvin <laughs> oh yes yes <laughs> it's in indelible in my mind uh yes absolutely and it that that statement is something that took me a long time to to get to but because i'm a psychotherapist um i listen to a lot of stories of people who are in their own closets whether that has to do with their sexuality or their uh or their passion for uh, some sort of profession that they had to let go of because it wasn't culturally accepted or accepted by their parents or didn't make a lot of money. Uh, everybody has closets. And it became clearer and clearer to me as I did therapy with people that my primary job as a therapist was to help people, one, recognize, and two, come out slowly in their time out of their closets so that their real selves can encounter the world and blossom and they can meet other people like them right and so <clears throat> i think that my own situation was like that i uh had a long journey i came out at around 42 or 43 but that was after a journey through a seminary uh, to get a theology degree in the hopes that if I got closer to God that God would cure me of being gay. It included a journey through an ex-gay ministry, a reparative therapy situation for seven years where I became an international speaker speaking all over the world about how God wants to heal us of our deepest shame and how being gay was part of that. Uh, that one particular shift remains probably the seminal shift in my life where this obsession with being someone whom God didn't hate shifted to a, a small understanding that perhaps the God I was worshiping 
actually loved who he had created me to be. And to learn how to try to grasp that knowledge and then live that knowledge out has been the rest of my coming out journey from that age, because that was 43, 44, and I'm 65 now. It took them 20 years. And I'm like Melvin, constantly coming out to myself and coming out to the world and coming out in places and to people I never thought. And the biggest uh, effect that it seems to have is that people then feel freer to come out to me, whether they're gay or they're straight or they're trans or they're struggling with whatever they're struggling with. And that's been the payoff. That's just the payoff because I feel like I get to live in my authentic story and I give permission to other people to live in theirs. And uh, especially when you come from a Japanese American culture, which tends to hide our individual stories so that we just show what looks good. That's a big deal. One thing you mentioned, uh, Gary, in your video that really, really broke my heart was um, when you had to like really deny yourself and gray yourself out. Mm -hmm. That really broke my heart. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I was very, very good at that. At you know, dulling all the edges and draining all the color back to, you know, muted colors, muted tones, almost so that I could move invisibly so that nothing would stick out where anyone would go, are you gay? Right? That was my biggest fear for the longest time. And I think that's why it took so long for me to come out, right? I had to learn how to live out loud and not to keep muting myself. <sighs> Yeah, Barney, I, I totally know which part of the video you're talking about. I, I definitely um, paused a few <laughs> times um, through all of your interviews. Um, Mia, did you want to chime in on this topic of coming out? I know that's a grand question, but... Oh, okay. Um, I think coming out trans is different. Uh, yes. in the sense that you really can't do it gradually uh, in that sense it, it's all one big bulk that you come out to people i'm trans and the only thing that i think you can actually hold off on is maybe the day that you start dressing full time and uh, presenting in a completely different way so coming out um is coming out trans is just a lot more in your face than coming out gay or lesbian because you're not going to look the same tomorrow um, and there's a certain amount of loss that, uh, that you think that you're inflicting on the people that love you, that they're losing a person that they had counted on for so long. Even though you're actually just being more yourself, it's um, interesting the way that people look at that as, as a form of loss. So um, I think it's just different. And trans coming out, um, it, particularly, I can tell you that coming out as a transgender lawyer uh, in the trial courts, which is a large community of people, uh, sort of like a sort of like going to the university every day there's a large crowd of people around you and when you look that different believe me uh it is it is a somewhat stunning sight for a lot of people and it definitely gets a lot more attention than if you tell somebody that uh, by the way i'm gay um it's interesting to be trans in that sense too because once i transitioned i turned not only transgender but lesbian um all of a sudden the people that i loved um were um, different from at least the norm. And so I actually achieved a couple different um, <laughs> coming outs. So um, coming out though, I think is really important. And like, and like Gary says, everybody's gotta come out, everybody's got to, to make that contribution, not just to themselves, but to the world. Um, and it does move the world, it does change the world, it does provide space for other people. Um, I came out in the trial courts that had never been um, transgender trial lawyer in any place in California that, that uh, I'd ever heard about, certainly. Um, still aren't too many. But once I did come out, a couple of district attorneys came out as trans. And um, they both told me that they couldn't have done it without me coming out there and doing oh. this thing and just being all by myself. So um, it at least helped a couple folks. And um, I think it continues to. I mean, just in terms of being a person who's an activist, 
you're out there trying to do good things out in the community if you can. And that's the most important role modeling, that we are who we are and we try to do good things for other people and we try to live up to our ideals. And um, this is who we are. This is what part of the community we are and uh, we have a contribution to make. Yeah, thank you for that, Mia. Um, and of course, all the, all of the contributions all of you have made, um, big and small in individuals' lives and in greater society. Um, you know, I, like hearing all of you speak, um, there definitely seems to be different layers of coming out, right? And one of the other, um, one of the layers of coming out is this idea of coming out to yourself. And, um, and, and, and I think another question that is common is this question of when did you know? When did you know you were gay? When did you know you were trans, right? Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if any of you would like to share um, what, what that process was like for you internally when, you know, how did you get to this point of having this inner dialogue about who you were and i'm sure all of us are continuing to have um within ourselves right like who we are um not just lgbtq but in all the sense of the word um so um if anybody would like to share or talk about what was that internal dialogue um that happened and how was it how was it connected to this idea of when you um, realize that you're quote unquote different, right? And being different, it can mean so many ways when you're in a predominantly white society, for example, then being Asian, being Japanese American, having ancestors that were interned in camps, like that could all be, a, give you a sense of feeling different, right? Um, so I love to hear more about that internal dialogue that you all had. I knew I knew really, really early on uh, in my life that I was gay. Uh, I never struggled with that. I never struggled knowing. And I didn't even, I, did, I was pretty naive. I didn't know and that people struggled with it until I came out <laughs> later on. <laughs> because I just thought everybody felt like me, uh, knew. But like, yeah, pre-adolescent, pre I knew. Uh, there was no question in my mind that I was that I would had same sex attraction from really early on. Um, and of course the irony is that I stayed in the closet for 55 years, um, but um, the struggle was never, the struggle was about being gay, but it wasn't my, I knew there was never a question in my mind. Uh, and I now understand of course that that's not always the case that people do struggle with knowing who they are, and it just takes a while. But um, yeah, so anyway, it was, it was easy. That part was actually easy. That was the easiest part of the journey. <laughs> Wait, so, so Melvin, what you're, uh -huh. saying, you're, what you're saying is that um, acknowledging to yourself that you were gay was the easy part. It was really about, okay, I'm gay, that's a fact. How do I now navigate society? Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I, I, but yeah, for me internally, it was, it, it was like, there was no question. I couldn't, I couldn't deny it. Um, I didn't, when I joined, so I joined the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, but prompted by Gary Hayashi. And, um, and I was just, I was overwhelmed. I was so surprised by, I found out that all these, so many, like over half the guys had been married to, to women. And I'm thinking to myself, why did they do that? Uh, because I was, when I was, again, when I was 11, I'm like thinking, I'm never, I'm not going to get married to a woman. I mean, that's, that's just not going to happen. So that was, all those things were already sort of taken care of, like really early, really early on in my life. And again, where other folks had to struggle with identity and so on. I totally understand that. But now, but at the time, I, again, it was like, these were all no brainers for me at such an early age. So in some ways I was, I count myself fortunate actually, only in the fact that I knew, I, I pretty much knew that I, I mean, from that vantage point, I knew who I was um, early on. Well, Melvin, I don't think that I knew who I was. <laughs> I knew that how I felt 
and I felt that way from ever since I can remember. I was pretty naive. I think that I never consciously through um, early teens assigned a sexual aspect to my thoughts. I didn't know what, uh, we didn't have the word gay. I didn't know what a homosexual was until a friend of mine called me a homosexual and I had to look it up and I realized, oh, <laughs> maybe. And even, even at that, it took me a while um, to come to grips because in a way I thought, oh, you know, this is normal. I was reading books. It's like a transition. I'll, I'll change and before you know it, I'll be liking girls and, and, you know, and then even through high school, it was kind of like I was trying to fit in and, and, um, and, you know, it, it, it wasn't that I, you know, I, I have really, I, anyone I ever dated, I just, I liked, and I mean, we were very close. I formed those relationships easily, I think. Um, but, you know, sexually, no, I wasn't there. So it took me a while and I kept thinking to myself, as long as I'm not sexually active, I am really not gay. Okay, well, as you grow older, that changes and then experiences changes and before you know it, you, you're accepting it yourself. But, you know, going back to what I just said, it's not like, it's not like a moment when I thought, oh yes, you know, I'm gay. It was a transition for myself and it, it was a, a, a long transition of a, not, a, not just knowing, but accepting, yes. Um, my coming out has a lot to do with my coming to terms with my feminine self. And so I have an older brother, he's 19 months older than me, and he's kind of the embodiment of testosterone. And that was really apparent, like he liked balls and trucks and, you know, army men and cowboys. And, and then 19 months later, I come along and I like Disney princesses and shiny pretty things. And I like colors and I like to draw and paint. And it was very, very apparent to me I did this event at Evergreen Baptist Church years ago, and one of the questions that came up is, when did you know you were gay? And I said, mm, probably around two, and this gasp went off in the room. But that was when I knew I was different in comparison to an older brother who embodied the idea of boy. And that was when it began to be apparent to me that when he gravitated to the things that were interesting and exciting to him, he was praised and encouraged. And when I gravitated to the things that were interesting or exciting to me, I got rebuke, humiliation, hostility, or, uh, uh, or, be, or I was ignored. And so I picked up very early that if I moved towards the things that were fascinating in terms of uh, uh, more uh, akin to what a girl would like, that that was the wrong thing to do and that was the wrong person to be. And that began my process of trying to hide all that color and all those edges and all that stuff. So one of the reasons I think it took me so long to come out was coming to terms with the feminine side of myself and that that didn't make me defective or weird or bad or anything like that. And even now I really struggle like listening to my speaking voice and on and on and on. But as life has it, you know, that coming out thing. So um, I've done drag in performance. Um, you know, the whole deal, wigs, makeup, heels. I've danced on stage with Lily Tomlin, this kind of thing. And to be able to do that in public, you know, is sort of an indication to me that I embrace my feminine side and that that doesn't label me one thing or another. It just means that's a side of me that uh, expresses itself through, you know, sort of a very outward thing. And by the same token, 
Um, I'm also part of the leather community in Los Angeles. And a lot of my masculine side expresses itself through my participation in those kinds of events. And so you can, you can be it all. <laughs> and so instead of being, you know, a third of myself, I get to be all of me in these different contexts and feel embraced and mirrored by communities where that's encouraged. And that's just the, one of the joys, I think, of being gay and coming out to yourself is finding out that there's so many people like you <laughs> who, who want you to be you. So. You know, I, uh, I want to kind of give a coming out perspective as a parent too, because as a parent, we have to come out. Mm -hmm. um, we have to figure out how we are going to tell the people that we love, our family around us, that our children are LGBTQ. And I'll, I'll tell you that when Aiden first came out, I think I went into the closet because I was so scared. I was ashamed of being a terrible mother and I was really sad. Um, but the fact was I didn't want Aiden to feel that I was ashamed of him. And I think that prompted me to just figure out how I as a mother could come out um, and it was a process, just like all of the, the people on the panel, it was a process. But, you know, this the whole idea of coming out and coming home, I don't think I could have built a home for my family without me somehow becoming visible, even in a small way with my family. Um, because I think home is a place that you have to feel safe and I wanted my child to feel safe. And I think it's a home is a place that you come back to and you feel comforted. So for LGBTQ people that are out there, uh, I just want them to know your parents are going through a process as well. And please be patient and compliment them when they say something, you know, um, when they do something right, because that meant all the difference to me and my husband. Marsha, I want to add on what you just said, and I wanted to bring in what Mia said earlier. And when she said when um, when she came out, there was you know her friends had, um, were, they they suffered a sense of loss uh, of of the person that they thought they that they knew the person they knew, and and. What I wanted to add is just that in coming out, um, it's, as you said, it's just not me, for example, coming out. Uh, there's there's got to be, you have to allow time to your friends and to your family. I mean, for me, for example, I've thought about coming out. I may have thought about this all my life. But for my friends and family, it's something that, that they're just handling it when I tell them. And so that you can either get uh, the quick response of, don't worry, I will support you, I love you, or you can get that response of, of uh, I don't know you, I reject you. But give things time because they're processing and they're going through this just as we all had to go through. So, you know, if you, have, if you love your friends and your family, give them time also. And coming out. I came out to my mother a um, long time ago and uh, you know I've been living my life as an openly gay man for a long time. Um, the relationship between my mother and me um, has been strained for a long time because like Marsha said uh, the parents need process, need time to heal and come out as well. So for the longest time, like every time we get together with relatives and friends, you know, they will ask me, Barney, you know, when are you getting married? Do you have a girlfriend? And stuff like obviously my mom has to come out to my friends and relatives. It took a long time. Um, and so our relationship was, became more and more distant. Um, as a matter of fact, that was a topic that was, the conflict was, the theme, the conflict of my last feature film, Baby Steps. I, I, I wrote about that, that story, that, that, that dynamic. And um, so I, I couldn't really talk to my, 
at one point I couldn't talk to my mom about how I felt. So I wrote the script and I gave it to her and she read it and she, for the first time she understood what was going on in, inside me, the things I couldn't talk to her about, I wrote it down and she read it. So that our project, the feature film that it did, sort of brought us together and brought us closer. And so now she was after like, I wanna say 20, 25 years later, she was finally able to talk to her friends and relatives and about me being gay and being open about it and be proud about it. So it takes time. Um, we just have to be, you know, as gay person, as LGBTQ person, we are so impatient, right? And that goes back to what uh, Melvin was talking about. We can't rush it uh, for ourselves and for other people. We just need to honor that process. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and and I'm really appreciating this conversation. And Marsha, thank you for um, being so candid about um, you know what what I understand to be you know a really challenging time in your life, right? And um, and and I'm gonna lean into what Bill said earlier about how you know I think like the the tendency of the Japanese community is to not talk about the hard things, but here we are talking about some hard things, right? And um, I'm wondering if any of you um, would be um, comfortable in sharing something that was very difficult for you in this whole process of, you know, whether it's coming out to yourself, coming out to your family and friends, um, you know, any, any sort of challenges that you've faced because, um, you know, th throughout like planning this whole event, um, getting to spend time with all of you. All of you are hilarious and just so full of joy. And when we're together, it's just so fun, right? But, um, but I think another part of that is I feel such gentleness from all of you. And I think that comes from the fact that all of us have really grappled with some difficult things that, um, that you know, maybe we're not interested in, um, in digging up or leaning into, but, but I do think that um, if, if we do feel, um, you know, moved to talk about those hard things and how we, um, how we navigated that and how we think it has um, influenced who we are today, that could be a really um, powerful thing for us to just like kind of witness in this space. Um, about each other. So if any of you have something you would like to share, um, I think it'll be lovely. I had, well, I know with respect to my family, you coming out to your family is always the most important thing to do. Uh, and I think particularly, I came out at 60 years old. I'm 77 now, so I'm definitely well over 50 or 40, whatever the criteria is here. But the thing about it was that um, he was the one I knew was going to be a problem, a second to the oldest brother. Pretty much the whole family was awkward, you could imagine. They had never heard of a transgender Japanese American person ever. So my family was sort of taken aback. But my brother said um, that he was completely disgusted, that uh, for me to get out of his life, that he was never going to talk to me again, that he was not my brother. Don't ever speak to any of my family, my kids, my grandkids. You just keep away from everybody in my life. And I guess I said, I said at the time, says, well, this is the last time I'm gonna to talk to you, I'm gonna thank you because you were the rebel of the family. You were the one that taught me, I didn't have to be what everybody wanted me to be, goodbye. So I haven't spoken to him in I guess going on 20 years now. He's not gonna give up with that. But let me just say that um, his kids love me, his wife loves me. He's the only one that sort of like, um, you know, Kind of called it off, but uh, I play in bands with with his three sons. We've been playing music together for the last I don't know how many years. We've been playing in bands together. So, but one other person I had that I wanted to share that I had this I'm a I'm a I'm a lawyer, an Asian American lawyer, and I had a friend who was a woman, a, a Asian American woman lawyer, and she was my friend and my ally for many years. But when I came out, it was it was something that uh, she couldn't manage, and she basically. She called me out publicly about my right to call myself a woman, uh, questioning that I have any right to do that. And there's an element of, I recognize that I didn't go through the struggles that a, a woman lawyer has gone through to grow up a girl, have to go through all that discrimination and all that um, 
oppression. I had to buy, I got to bypass a lot of that. <laughs> Let me just say that so I can understand her resentment. But it's kind of like from my point of view, I feel like I went through my own struggles to get to where I am. And so I don't feel at all deficient in that sense or is that somehow that I'm somehow uh, I guess representing myself as having gone through it something um, and not been real, not been authentic. Um, it's an issue that transgender people go through their whole lives. Spend a whole life feeling like you're this awful thing. And that once you embrace it, you realize it's just claiming who you are um, and claiming your authenticity and whatever it is. <laughs> hey Mia, one of the stories- It's yours to live with. <clears throat> and it's not really something, oh, I'm sorry, it's just something that, that other people have any business in many ways um, doubting or judging. It is simply what it is. And like every other person, you have to claim who you are. And many people, and Gary will verify this, try to get rid of things that are part of them. And they spend a whole life trying to get rid of something that's just an integral part of them. And it's just something you have to give up, reclaim it, become it, own it, and go forward. It is what you are, therefore, it can be made into a positive thing. So Mia, one of the, one of the uh, uh, stories that you told uh, from, for the video, uh, you talked about your clients, uh, death penalty clients, were, were, were the people that prevented you from coming out. Could you talk about that? That was, to me, that was really compelling. For maybe 20 years while I was doing death penalty litigation, I, I felt like I couldn't come out because I've got these people relying upon me. Their lives are on the line. And I felt that if I transitioned, that I would somehow uh, disadvantage them in, in the trial ahead in terms of switching over. However, so I had to come out anyway. I, mean, I, I still had a death penalty case when I finally decided I, I'm either going to, I got to come out now. I just, regardless of who gets hurt in many ways, and I felt like I had to do it. But I came out to my clients and um, I was amazed. I, I basically told them, listen, I'm going to change my gender. I know this is a bait and switch. I know that I came on as a male and you're going to get a female. So if you can't manage this, I know some of the best lawyers in LA, you'll be better taken care of than anything. If you can't manage staying with me. And then they all stayed with me. Every single one of them. I went to each one of them individually. And um, I have to say, none of them was they were all surprised, <laughs> let me just say that. But they all said uh, kind of the same thing. Why would I want somebody else besides you? Um, and I was moved uh, to tears from how little I had expected from them. Honestly, from the, from the lawyers, the cops, the judges, from everybody, I was moved to tears by how little I had expected from them. Um, the reception I got was, was something that nobody has a right to expect in this world. It was so good and so gracious and so welcoming that, um, uh, you know, I, I, how could I expect something like that? It's just impossible to, to anticipate or expect that, that kind of positivity. But that is the story. I wish I could give you some heartrending stories of struggle, but <laughs> there was some of that there, but most of it was overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, thank you, Mia. I mean, it, it really seems like um, for you, I mean, what it sounds like to me is that you had very clear boundaries in your, in your heart already, right? Like when you were having the conversation with your brother, when you were, um, you know, when you decided to transition and to tell your clients, right? Like you, it seems like you had a very clear vision of who you were and also what you not what just what you wanted, but what you needed in your own life. And, and that was really kind of your guiding um, star in a way. My clients were the second most important community next to my family. Um, they were my responsibility. I, um, next to my family, in many ways, my clients are more important than my family. So they were, they were a high priority. I had to make sure I stayed true to them uh, it's something I've, I've got to stay true to or else I can't feel good about what I do. Similarly to, uh, to what my, this shared that, uh, so I, I resigned from, I was, a, I've been a, I was a pastor for 
25, 30 years at different churches in LA, Northern California. So I resigned from my position at Christian Layman Church in Oakland, California in the spring of 2010 before I start my outing process. But uh, all those years I stayed in the closet because similarly to what Maya just shared that, I mean, I love my people and I loved ministry. Uh, I loved doing what I was doing. And I knew that at least in the Asian American Christian community that I was in, that once I outed myself, that was the end of my career. So I stayed in the closet because not the only reason, but certainly one of the highest priorities was I stayed in because I loved my work and I loved people. Um, it was hard, it was painful to obviously to leave, um, but it was, it was the right time. Um, and now I'm back at um, Evergreen Baptist Church of Los Angeles where Gary and I both worked in the closet and um, they've rehired me as a pastoral counselor to work with them with the whole issue of same-sex marriage now at the church. They're trying to figure out a policy and procedure um, going forward, but, they re but they've rehired me now knowing I'm the openly gay man to come in and help. And um, so it's a point of redemption um, and definitely a point of healing. I'm grateful. Um, it, it, there was so much, yes, there was a lot of pain involved with the, with all the, the leaving, but sort of, again, it, yeah, this is, it's wonderful to be, to be in a place now where people want who I am, all of who I am, um, and which is a great gift. I want to... Thank Mia and Melvin for their stories. I, I could share the story of a difficult time in my life. And again, I don't believe that I had anything extraordinary. I was just a gay person growing up in the 70s and 80s. And it was interesting because at the time I I was just come I was just coming out to, in the gay community. And, you know, I never thought about uh, love or ending up with somebody. Uh, that was kind of like beyond uh, the parameters that were available to me. But I was lucky enough to find somebody. And we bought a house together. And then um, it was really good. And then about two years later, he was diagnosed with AIDS. And at that time in the 80s, um, it was a death sentence. It was more than a death sentence. It was, you were treated like a pariah. This is inside the, outside the community and also inside the community. Uh, it was rampant in our community. You could just see people and know. And my partner um, just said he doesn't want anybody to know. He doesn't want anybody to find out. He doesn't want any not to let his um, employer know or anybody, not to let my family or friends or, so in essence, I'd be, I, we shut ourselves up. And it was really difficult for me because I tend to be very close to my family and all my friends. And all of a sudden it was like, I stopped seeing them, my, my sister, or, or my brother would come up to visit and I would say, oh, could you stay at the hotel, you know? Um, and, and that was really, that was a really difficult time. And, and I had just promised him that, you know, while he was alive, I would never let anybody know. Um, at the same time, I, I need to say that it was a hard time, but at the same time, you know, when you're, when you're a caregiver to someone that you really love, you have some really good moments. But it came a time when, you know, one opportunistic affection, we, you know, people can get it and then rebound. It's just amazing. Well, one time, you know, he didn't rebound and we knew what was going to happen and he passed away. And then at that time, I, um, I told the people at work 
And I told the people, I told my family that, uh, you know, my partner of like 13 years had passed away. And then that was the first time that I, I basically publicly came out. And, um, and that was, a, that was pretty good. I mean, what was, what was nice was I got a lot of support from my family and have ever since. And I had got a lot of um, support and understanding from the people at work. So, you know, it was a really difficult time in my life. But again, there were good points. I mean, there were, there were memories that I'll never forget. Uh, but that, that was a struggle for those, for those eight years when he was uh, diagnosed. Thank you for sharing that, um, Bill, and um, for all of you for, for sharing this. Um, and yeah, and, and, and I think that, um, you know, I, I, I hope that by us sharing this space to, to be able to talk about these difficult things, right, is, um, can, can also serve as a model in some ways that, you know, there, these spaces for community is definitely a space to share joy, but to also talk about these challenges or even um, in a way understand how to talk about challenges and, and, and not just to talk about it as, oh, this hard thing happened in my life, but, also, but just really um, get to a point where we're able to have like a nuanced understanding of, oh, this is, this is what happened and this is how it's connected to, to who I am today. And, um, and this is, and it's going to affect the way that I show up for other people and for myself. And so um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of um, all of you for, for sharing things that I know um, are not necessarily pleasant to, to talk about, right? Um, but, but just really want to um, j just share the um, appreciation. Aya, can I jump of in course. here? There's this thing you said about the public spaces. One of the most difficult things for me when I was thinking about coming out is that I didn't see any Japanese Americans that I knew. Uh, I didn't see uh, anybody who was connected with the Asian American Christian community who had come out. That for, for Asian Americans that I knew, especially who were involved in church, a lot of people just sort of disappeared when they came out, just poof into thin air. They moved away, they went underground, they just didn't show up. And, you know, in my work as a, as a therapist, I'm really big on the concept of mirroring, that one of the ways we arrive at our identity and a centeredness and identity is if who we are is mirrored back to us so that we recognize ourselves. And I always had an ambivalent relationship, especially with the Japanese American community, because I didn't see anybody who was out in the Japanese American. I'd go to Little Tokyo and no male couples are holding hands as far as I could tell. And it was just a really hard issue to sort of to, uh, deal with. So, so the first time I walked into Okaidi, the very first conference we had, I was ambivalent about it. I said, is this going to be like, you know, everybody's going to be acting all polite and nobody's going to really talk about what's going on? Because that was my sort of experience around Asian Americans, right? And to walk into the space, and of course, there's Marsha crying at the podium, welcoming everybody with the most open heart in the world, right? And everybody falling in love with her. And it's subsequently over the two days or whatever day. I don't remember if it was one day or two days, right? Everybody sort of falling in love slowly with each other and going, oh, you're my brother. Oh, you're my sister. Oh, you, oh, I belong to you. And I didn't even know you were out there. And it was a revelation, right? That all these people, gay, lesbian, trans, questioning, intersex, are out there. Japanese Americans, and we all have our stories. Some of the allies were there. A lot of allies were there telling their stories. And it was, oh, we're not invisible anymore. And it helped me not be so invisible to the Japanese American community anymore. 
right? Because I had been mirrored, I had experienced that feeling of, oh, I'm not the only one. <laughs> or Melvin and I are not the only ones. <laughs> And that, that's why Okaidi and the, the gatherings and these kinds of events are important because my hope is that somebody's going to see this who's frightened and a little unsure of what's happening in their own history and they're going to hear something that one of us says that helps them take the next step or gives them courage or just or delights them about themselves, right? So, so I want to add to what Gary said. Um, not only do we not see like Japanese American LGBTQ people visible, but we don't. We also don't see like Japanese American gay men, for example, dating Japanese American men or Asian men dating Asian men. So, like growing up, we see images of white people, and that being socialized like that way, we equate whiteness as beautiful. We never see ourselves as beautiful. We rarely see Asian American couples, two Asian men, two Asian women, things like that. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you know, we need to empower our community to be more visible. And going back to the idea of providing more role models, we need young people to see that we are here. We are beautiful. That we're going to date, you know, see ourselves as beautiful. That's another visibility that we need to like. Yeah, I totally hear you. I think, you know, totally. and, and I think this is still a thing in, in my generation and the younger generation still too, right? I mean, I, I was born and raised in Japan and I had intense internalized racism, um, you know, living in the States. Um, I, I hated Japan. I didn't want nothing to do with it. And I think there was a long stretch of time when I was like, Asians don't want anything to do with that. Japanese, no, right? And um, and and I think so. There is definitely um, a lot to, to unearth there too. And um, and and this conversation really, um, I feel like, is leading to one of the questions that we have in the Q and A actually, um, which is this question that that asks. As Japanese Americans specifically, how have you approached the extra challenge of settling your racial identities while also settling your queer identity, right? So I think this is really um, a question about that, that very particular intersection of being Japanese, Japanese American, and LGBTQ+. And so if, if anybody wants to speak more on that, um, please do. And, and I think another question that might be a little bit tied to this, um, is this question about as an out and proud person in the LGBTQ community and a Japanese American, do you feel you have a presence in the greater LGBTQ community, right? So what does it mean for you to be a Japanese American LGBTQ plus person in the greater LGBTQ community? And I think Gary, you spoke a little bit about this, but um, I think these two questions um, are um, or where the conversation's going. So if anybody wants to talk about that. I can talk a little bit about it because I think that um, being Japanese American and knowing the legacy of Japanese Americans and the discrimination that we suffered lends itself easily to be active with LGBTQ issues also, because they are all based on, on race, um, stereotyping and, and that type of uh, belief. And then I know that for myself in 2012, I was able to really leverage being Japanese American with the, uh, the freedom to marry initiatives that were happening in Washington. In fact, I was able, I was asked to speak a lot um, as part of the People of Color initiative representing um, the LGBT issue initiative for uh, marriage equality. And uh, part of it came because, you know, I'm active with JCL and JCL was one of the first groups to 
endorse same-sex marriage. And, and I was also able to, I always used to like to end my, my talks or my presentations by, by saying that um, when this issue passes, then I will know how my grandparents felt when they were allowed to be citizens and how my parents felt when the redress was passed and that when the freedom of marriage is passed in Washington, then I will know that I'm a, a full-fledged citizen of the state and that I would be allowed to marry and I would hold up my engagement ring and say the man that I love. And I think that that really, I felt empowered about um, being able to leverage both being Japanese Americans and being a member of the LGBT community. When I, uh, when I came out, I mentioned I joined the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. And prior to that, I had gone to Japan for the first time in my life, uh, late in life too. Uh, and the similarities, I had the exact same experience when I, when I got off the plane at Narita and when I walked into the room with 300 gay men. And the first thing that happened was I said, oh my God, these people are so strange. And it was just entering two different cultures that I had never been in before. And I was like, oh, this is, this is such a weird thing. Japan is a weird place. And, and these gay people are really pretty, they're pretty bizarre too. So, I mean, that was the number one, that was the reaction in both Narita and both at the San Francisco Gay Men's Course. The second reaction I had in the same, both scenarios was, I'm home. And I knew immediately what it felt like to be a majority all my life. I had never felt that before. And that walking in and just being there with, these are my people. And immediate, this kind of connection, I can't even, I can't even explain it. Um, but when it happened, I knew that I wasn't, and like we've shared, I knew I wasn't alone. I knew I wasn't, you know, the strange, it was like, I'm, I'm here. These are, this is it. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the Asian, being Japanese, being gay, uh, finding that identity, um, and it's, it's still a trick, even in the, in the world, uh, in the context of where I am now, but, but I like, but being in those two places gave me appreciation, finally, for just being the man that I believe God made me to be. So, uh, yeah, fun. Yeah, these are these are um, really lovely examples of. You know, I, I think I think all of you have spoken a lot about. Um, the intersection between being LGBTQ plus and the profession slash jobs that you have. And, and, and it seems like there were a lot of moments when, you know, you felt very seen in, as your whole self um, in, in, in whatever job you do. Um, and, but then I think sometimes um, it's, it's sometimes harder to, to think about the situations where we feel seen and whole at the intersection of being LGBTQ plus and Japanese and Japanese American, right? Um, and so, so yeah, I think, I think these are, these are really um, important um, examples to, to really hear. Um, we have another question um, that's, I think, I think in a way is a little bit connected to this too, right? Um, which is a question about Japanese American families. Um, so the question says, other than concealing, how else do Japanese American families deal with having an LGBTQ person in their midst, right? And of course, the question is not asking us to give all the answers, but um, if there are any um, examples, and, and I know like um, folks have already shared a little bit about their own family dynamics, but if there's anything um, else you'd like to share um, that you've seen or you've experienced. I know Mark, that. Oh, I'm sorry. 
just want to say my example, my experience is that the Japanese American family is not very comfortable either with being LGBT, LGB or T. And they have a tendency not to talk about it. I think even when you're in the room with your family, I, I've always got the sense that they felt that it was a little bit rude to start talking about your sexuality or your gender identity. And that everybody sort of got uncomfortable talking about that. And because they're all uncomfortable, it's really not easy to be the only person in the room who can speak to that topic, from my experience. So I think just generally, um, because I was born in camp, I grew up in post-war Los Angeles, where it was not too cool to be Japanese, not to speak Japanese, or to associate with Japanese. So being a pariah is something that uh, probably gave me a, a little bit of prelude to coming out transgender, uh, because it's like coming out um, on steroids, because it is so visible and so profoundly um, upsetting and disturbing for a lot of the people around you who are so used to seeing you present a certain different way. So my feeling about being Japanese is in many ways, culturally, even more restrictive. More restrictive in terms of coming out, talking about it, trying to explain it, uh, having any kind of a long dialogue or conversation about it. And certainly in Japanese America, as well as a lot of other communities, nobody wants to talk about your sexuality, you know, um, unless, you're, unless you're straight people who seem to be able to talk about that with any kind of, um, you know, impunity. Uh, but you don't see gay and trans people talking about their gender identity or their trans identity, um, their, their sexual orientation around family. It's not considered a topic that's um, welcome. You know, I, I, I kind of answered that, um, you know, in response to the Q&A, but I just want to say mm -hmm. that there are, we're seeing more and more families coming to like our PFLAG group, and it's a way for them to still be kind of private. You know, they don't have to tell their family, but they can get support. Um, and our PFLAG group is um, in San Gabriel Valley, it's Asian Pacific Islander. But just recently on September 6th, Okaidi started a group just for Japanese Americans. And we had over 40 people that came to our first meeting. We had people that came from Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, and they're mainly LGBT. We had 75% LGBT and about 25% parents. But we feel if we create a group like this, if the LGBT person, their parents are struggling, then they, they know there's a place that the parent can come. And the parent doesn't have to be that visible, doesn't have to be that out, but they can get support. Actually, we're working on another group um, that's starting in November, and it's going to be through Okaidi, but for those that are Japanese speaking. So we're trying to, you know, uh, bridge that you don't have to be totally visible, but you don't have to be in the closet, but you can get support. So you can support your LGBTQ uh, family member. And I think it's important for parents and family members to have that space because they don't know what to do. Um, one really quick thing, we're also coming out with uh, posters on harmful and helpful behavior and language. So when I came out, I didn't know what was helpful and harmful. And I made a lot of mistakes. Um, so we hope this is going to be really helpful as well. Okaidi is doing a translation in Japanese, and we also have an English version. And it's with uh, the Family Acceptance Project out of San Francisco State University. So there's the spaces and there are resources coming out. We just put in a plug for PFLAG. I believe that PFLAG uh, and Okaidi will be the most influential political force to advance the LGBT community. Because it's not us speaking in our self-interest, those of us who are LGBT. It is our parents, it is our friends, it is the people who love us, advocating for us, that have seemed to make the biggest difference in legislatures and in voting groups. So let me just say a big shout out, PFLAG, especially PFLAG San Gabriel Valley, you have done so much to change our community and to change the parents' attitudes towards their LGBT children. I salute you. I think you're doing more than any of us could ever do for this community. And so I want to plug our group, PFLAG San Gabriel Valley. We meet tomorrow 
3 p.m. So join us tomorrow. Go to our website, <laughs> contact us, we'll send you the link. Good job, Barney. Good Barney. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is actually a really good segue into another question, um, which is, you know, about what, what role do we have in making change, right? Creating change. So the question is, in this political moment created by the uprisings and rebellions connected to the movement for black lives and all black lives matter, activists and communities have, been, have seen victories on many issues and fights for some efforts that have gone on for many years. What kind of opportunities for victories do you see or would like to see for Japanese American API LGBTQ plus folks and communities? I would love to see Japanese American support very specifically for Black Lives Matter, which is a movement which has become something of a beacon in, the, in this particular struggle, but it's also come under fire. The right wing, the boogaloo boys, uh, all these proud uh, boys and all these right wing um, provocateurs have targeted Black Lives Matter and that it is a really important movement. And I believe this, the civil rights movement, which is something that we've all should be a part of because they have benefited us tremendously, not just Asian Americans, but LGBT people have benefited from the struggles of the civil rights movement. It all comes down to the struggle for black liberation. And that's what powered, that's what initiated the civil rights movement. We should be a part of this movement. I believe that it is so integral to the advancement of our communities that we make peace with the rest of this world, with people of color, that policemen and the government can no longer do whatever they want to people of color. And that's an important message that Japanese Americans have to cover forward, carry forward. Whether or not it's happening in our communities, it's definitely happening to black and brown communities. I think it is a measure of our awareness of what's going on around us and our compassion for other oppressed people who are being marginalized murdered, imprisoned. Uh, this is something that we can't turn away from. And we as Japanese Americans with a legacy of unjust imprisonment cannot stand aside seeing this happen to other people without raising our voices, standing up and supporting Black Lives Matter. All lives will not matter until Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Mia. Anybody else want to um, say I, I, I just want to throw this in because this is sort of less about the external behavior and more the internal process. My particular stance towards the Black Lives Matters movement is this is again <clears throat> the patriarchal powers trying to label, take the power of labeling people as subnormal or the other. And as part of a group of people, Japanese Americans, who were incarcerated because that label was thrown on us during World War II, the, one of the deepest political acts I think that we can do in vis-a-vis -vis ourselves is to, to to understand that I will not let anyone take normal away from me again. And that there are groups in this country who want to label who I am as abnormal and not deserving of equal rights. And I refuse to give that up because I fought so hard to get internally in my cycle, psyche to a place of normal and joining, uh, our efforts with the Black Lives Movement is saying we will not allow whoever is in power to take that label of normal away from African American, our African American brothers and sisters, our Latino brothers and sisters, people of color in general. We are fighting to exist in a state of normalcy in a country that has been all too quick to label others as subnormal or as other. And I refuse to let that happen. So that helps me sort of, I 
will stand with my brothers and sisters because somebody's trying to take normal away from them. And we fought too hard to get this far. We're not there yet. But we need to keep moving towards that, right? Otherwise, we let labels, untrue, destructive labels, separate us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I totally agree. And um, I just want to say that, you know, I, it, it's sometimes frustrating as a, as a younger person when, um, you know, I, I think sometimes there's this misunderstanding that the older generation is somewhat more conservative around certain topics. And so that's why I feel like these multi intergenerational spaces are so important, because I think that's clearly not true, right? Like, I mean, right now on this panel, um, all of us are, are sharing very similar sentiments and our commitment um, in various ways to, to really um, doing our part in, in, in really, um, base, re really taking part in this revolution that's been happening um, for for many many decades, right? And um, and so I'm, I just want to say that I really appreciate um, any space that's that's multi generational because I think we have so much to to learn from each other always. Um, and so I we have um, two more questions that um, that I do want to get to before we wrap up. Um, so, so, and it's, it's, and I have to like say that it's a little bit of a shift from the conversation we were having, but I think the, these are um, important questions. So I want to raise them. Um, so one of the questions is, um, to what degree do non-binary gender identities exist? Um, uh, sorry, I just lost that. Hold on. Okay. So the question is, to what degree do non-binary gender identities exist? or have validity to LGBTQ Japanese American community. Um, and I can say for, um, at least from my understanding, um, I have definitely in the Okaidi planning committee and also in folks who have participated in Okaidi, um, there I have met many folks who identify as non-binary and Japanese American. And, um, and, I, and I think that um, it's, also something that we um, should always create more space to talk about, right? Like that, um, that sexuality and gender is not binary, right? It's, there, it's just such a spectrum. And I think even from talking today, we can see that I'm sure we can check off similar boxes, but even within those boxes, there's such a spectrum of how we relate to masculinity, how we relate to femininity, how we relate to gender, how we don't relate to gender, how we relate to sexuality or don't relate to sexuality. So um, I just wanted to say that, but if anybody um, wants to offer anything about um, you know, non-binary identities, um, please feel free. And I'm gonna attach the other question because I think this is a little bit um, connected is that now that you are out, have any older folks confided in you about being LGBTQ, right? And the, the person who asked this question said, this seems like one of the last real quote unquote secret stories from World War II, both camp and military. So, so I think this, this question um, is, you know, in part about, you know, as, as we get older, we are, role models to younger generations, but I think we're also role models to our own peers, right? And so um, if you have anything you'd like to offer around that. I have to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest person here, I think. I'm 77. And I have to admit, older uh, Nisei, um, Nisei folks may have been gay, and I would hear that from other people, but I never heard it directly from them. Nobody ever came out to me at, at that age, uh, or even around my age. So I, it, it just, I never heard it from an older uh, Japanese American person, period. And um, 
they're really just, if there was a transgender Japanese American person someplace in the previous generation, I heard nothing about them. Uh, so nothing directly, um, certainly about being transgender, nothing um, um, even indirectly. Um, it's just something that just still does not exist in the dialogue or communication that I'm in touch with. I was uh, walking in San Francisco either a year ago or two years ago, and I just happened to pass the LGBTQ museum, and I had some time to kill, so I ducked in there, and there was an exhibit uh, that someone had got, done extensive research on whether there were gay or lesbian people, especially in the internment camps, and the only thing they found, and they posted it, and I took photographs of it, with these photographs of this particular man who, you know, is with other men and a film, a home movie that was shot in the 50s of this particular man hosting a gay party at his house. And I have to tell you, I started crying when I saw that because it meant there were LGBTQ people in camp. They just couldn't tell their truth. But there were elders and they existed on some level. And, and to just be able to say, you know, this isn't something that we're at the forefront of, this, this existed before and that we share our stories in honor of them as well as for the benefit of those who come before us. <clears throat> and whether that's the elders the G, B, the T, the I, the A, it, that we all existed before. And I want to share, Aya, that um, we'll probably post it on our Facebook page or our website, but Stan Yogi, who is a co-chair for Okaidi, and Amy Suyoshi, who is from San Francisco State, and Jay Say, it's an organization in Northern California, they're putting together like a, a virtual exhibit. Mm -hmm. And I think it deals a lot with this queer history and, and people in our history. Um, so I would encourage people to check out this virtual exhibit, which is gonna be starting on October 11th, and it will run all the way through February. And there are a, a number of other programs that we're going to be hosting and working with JSA on. Um, so I think it kind of goes along with this because it has to do with the, the queer, queer history. So uh, people, please look for some of these programs that are, uh, that are gonna be offered in, and shown on our website and our Facebook page. Thank you. And I wanna put a plug in for Dent Show, um, which I've considered to be the nation's uh, best uh, digital online repository for the World War II Japanese American experience. And they did do uh, a, um, work on looking for uh, gay, queer, lesbian, LGBT um, people during World War II and in the camps. And they, they ran some articles on that and it was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I, I don't believe, I don't, know of anyone older than me who came out after I came out. But at the same time, you know, when you, when you're, when you're, you come out in the, in the community, then um, there are people that, that are gay that they come out to you, but it's kind of like, it's not like they're open. It's kind of like a little, not a secret, but it's like a bond or something. So there are, you have that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that surprised me was um, when my partner and I got married, when we had um, what we called a community gathering um, of uh, for, uh, people in the Japanese American community and my friends from work and everything. Uh, it was a celebration. There was about 200 people there and they were from all sorts of uh, organizations uh, in in um, in Seattle, and what surprised me was later on we were just celebrating. A lot of people, or not a lot, 
there were people that came up to me later and thanked me for having our our reception in the open. And then they would tell me, um, you know, my son is gay or my daughter is a lesbian, but, you know, we don't talk about that, but they wanted me to know. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Thank you um, for all these resources and for all your stories. Um, so we're at the end of our event, but I do want to wrap up with one question. And because we're running short on time, I'm going to ask each of you to try to keep it short. Um, but I would love to hear um, what is um, a piece of advice that you would like to give to your younger self? And younger can mean anything. It can be just yourself a year ago. It can be yourself when you were five years old. Anything, anything you want. So, um, and I'm going to have each of you answer this, so you can't run away. <laughs> so whoever feels comfortable, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to I, I tell my younger self that you are beautiful the way you are. And you are beautiful. I told, when we did the interview, I, I answered the question. I just said to little Melvin, um, you, don't, you don't understand yet that you are a gift to the world. So similar to what Barney just said, um, I said, you will understand someday, but just to hold that in your, hold that. Well, I would say what I said in the video was um, doesn't matter what I said to my younger self because my younger self wouldn't listen. But <laughs> I, I'll change my answer though because I I get this from my husband every day is no matter how bad things are, he always makes me smile and laugh. And I think that's important. I would tell myself, you know, no matter how bad things are or how you feel, try to smile and laugh. I would tell my younger self, never stop fighting. It's worth the battle. You're worth the fight. Never give up. I would tell my younger self that uh, you're going to be a good mother. I'm going to cry. You're going to be a good mother. You might make mistakes, but as long as you lead with your heart and you lead with love, then you're going to find your way. Oh, thank you, Pia. <laughs> I would tell my younger self that through the fear you will find love. Love of family, love of community, love of another man. That don't despair, that love is in your future, even though you don't feel it now. And that is, that's the plan it will go as planned. It doesn't matter what obstacles get thrown in your way. Love will be your legacy, both what you give to the world and what you are working in your heart to be able to receive. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for that offering. Um, so that concludes our event, our wonderful conversation. Um, thank you all for everything that you shared and, um, and everybody for participating and for the questions. Um, uh, as just a reminder, um, you can watch these interviews um, on Okaidi's website. Um, so that is okaity-losangeles.org I mean, slash media. 
Um, and I think Joy has dropped the link into the chat box a few times. So um, please be sure to check that out. And I'm going to turn it over to Joy for some closing comments. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, this has really been a really powerful conversation. And as one of the queer younger folks that has benefited from your um, your stories, it's really powerful to hear you all speak. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to remind folks that the information is on the chat, as Aya said. Um, please check out the rest of Visual Communications Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival that's going to be continuing throughout um, the upcoming month. And um, there's some really exciting programs. We're actually getting to do one on the Atomic Cafe tomorrow at 2 p.m. So please check that out on YouTube. Um, and please also support Okairi and all the events that uh, Marsha and all them mentioned in there as well. Um, we welcome you in at Janum and hope to see you at other Janum from home events. Um, so with that, I think we're going to conclude for today, but thank you so much again. Thank you to everyone who participated um, and stay safe. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.